The whole of the universe runs according to law. Planet Earth runs according to law. The human body runs according to law. Law is a wonderful thing. It's not often seen as such, but it is known that adherence to law brings harmony. Breaking of law brings disharmony. Let me begin my presentation with a quote from a, a book called Education, page 100. It's a paragraph. The same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike star and atom control human life. The laws that govern the action of the heart, regulating the current of flow to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. To all objects of his creation, the requirements are the same. A life exercised in harmony with the Creator's will, a life sustained by receiving life from the Creator. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. Majestic words. But let's have a look at those three laws. To transgress his law, whether it be physical or whether it be mental or whether it be moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. What are the physical laws? I have the physical laws listed above, but let's have a look at them. Law number one is pure air. Pure air contains oxygen. And we can't go long without oxygen. It's the most vital element needed for life in the human body. Every cell requires oxygen to function. In fact, a cell that has adequate amounts of oxygen produces 18 times the energy of a cell that does not have that oxygen. The second law is sunshine. The sun is not the enemy in the sky. The sun is the healer in the sky. And sunshine kills something that causes many people to be sick today in bad air, and that's fungal spores, moles. It just annihilates it. It's the best disinfectant that there is. That's why we should always hang our clothes out in the sunshine. Some people say, Barbara, but there's not much sunshine where I live. Well, just make the most of what you've got. You do not need a lot of sunshine to get all the vitamin D. And vitamin D is absolutely essential in the assimilation and the utilisation of calcium in the body. And calcium is called the king, because when calcium gets in, all the other minerals get in. All from sunshine. The third law is temperance. And temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. Most people are aware of the danger of drugs, the danger of alcohol, the danger of cigarettes. Many people don't realise that mercury is a neurotoxin. If you have mercury fillings in your mouth, it's a good idea to find a biological dentist and have them removed because mercury is bioaccumulative. That means that the longer it's in the mouth, the more it is accumulating in the tissues and it can kill the brain cells. What a lot of people don't realise is the danger of sugar. At our health retreat, I have three books written on the subject. One is called Sugar Blues by William Dufty. Another book is called Sweet Poison by David Gillespie. And another book is, is called Pure, White and Deadly by a British Dr. Yutkin, all showing the dangers of the pure crystallised acid that's extracted from the sugarcane plant. It is causing all manner of problems. It is well acknowledged to be a big contributing factor to the diabetic epidemic that we are seeing in the Western countries today. But what's also increasing to the diabetic problem is wheat. You see, wheat was hybridised in the 50s and it produced a starch that gets the blood sugar level up even higher than sugar. When we look at uh, diabetes, I'll show you that in detail. Caffeine. Caffeine disrupts the neurotransmitters in the brain. And it's a big contributing factor to the mental illnesses that we're seeing today. 
So temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it. Get the chemicals out of your home. And one chemical that's not often seen as such is mould. Make sure there is no mould in your home. Keep the fans on. Put the dehumidifiers in the basement. Keep it clean. Remember, mould, fungus, they're just opportunist organisms. They like it where it's damp and dark and where there's dirt. So keep that house clean. No need for chemicals when you keep it clean. So temperance means not taking anything into the body that will harm it and taking in moderation the good things. Even good things can become bad if they are overdone. The fourth law, the fourth physical law is rest. Stomach needs a rest between meals. Stomach needs to sleep when you sleep. We should be eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper. In the Ten Commandments, the fourth commandment is a rest commandment. It says, six days God made heaven and earth, seventh day he rested. We should do all our work in six days and rest the seventh. Another aspect of rest is our nighttime sleep. Before electric lights, people used to go to bed when the sun went down and wake up when the sun got up. But today, because of electricity, many people are awake in the hours when they should be asleep. Between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m., four hormones are released that are responsible for rest and rejuvenation in the body. Number five is exercise. The body must move. Strength comes by exercise. There is no other way. And today, because women aren't scrubbing their clothes and beating their, their, their carpets and sweeping their floors, which was hard work, and many men are chopping the wood, that we have to take time to do some physical exercise. Many people today are in sedentary jobs where they're sitting down all day. So it's very important to take time to exercise. Because most people don't have enough time, my suggestion is have a good look at the high intensity interval program. We looked at this in our lecture yesterday. High intensity interval program or interval training is when you do periods of very high intensity, periods of recovery. You can get your exercise program down to 15 minutes. That exercise will cause a dramatic influx of blood to the brain, to the extremities. When people say to me, I've always got cold feet, I said, you need to exercise. My brain, it's just not working like it used to. You need to exercise. It's a not negotiable subject. We need to do it every day. The sixth physical law is proper diet. And in Genesis 1.29, God tells us the proper food he tells us the food that is best for mankind. He says, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed upon the face of the earth. What's a herb bearing seed? That's your grain, that's your legumes, your nuts. Sorry, that's your seeds. Your nuts are the next one. And it says, and the, and the fruit bearing, the, the tree that, that brings the fruit. You know, a nut comes from the fruit of the tree. And then the Bible says, the seed to you, it shall be for me. Because it is in the seed that all the essential ingredients needed for the proper functioning of the body are found. In your seeds are found excellent sources of protein, very clean burning fuel compared to animal protein. Did you know that animal protein burns at 58% 50, 50, uh, fuel? That's a 42% waste. And as I showed you yesterday, that the microbes, they, they are opportunist organisms and they're going to live where there's filth. So a meat-eating diet produces a, a quite a, a, a dirty residue, a good ground for the microbes to live. And God also brought in the, the vegetables after the fall, the, the herbs and the, the green leaves, very, very high in minerals. So proper diet would include a high-fibre diet, all plant foods have fibre, particularly of vegetables. Generous amounts of protein, that's in all your seeds, and your healthy fats, which are also found in your seeds, and your olive oils, your coconut oils. Number seven, the seventh law, is use of water. Notice the term use of water. 
meaning that there's a time to drink water and there's a time when we should not be drinking water. Digestion is a chemical process and water dilutes the chemicals. So the only time we should not drink is with our meals. We should stop drinking water about half an hour before the meal and resume drinking about an hour and a half after the meal. That gives a little time for digestion to happen in that nice acid environment. If you sit to your meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink with your meal. It is such a habit today, isn't it? If ever Michael and I are in a restaurant, the first thing we're asked is, what will you drink? And we say, uh, no, thank you. And they look at us as if there's something wrong. So they bring us water and we let them put water on our table. And sometimes if they really push it, we say, well, we've already drunk our water. But I think most people realise that a lot of restaurants make their money in the drinks that you order while you're eating. We had an Indian lady do our program. She said to me, and she was from India, she said, I was surprised when I came to Australia. She said, people are drinking with their meals. She said, don't they know? She said, we do not drink with our meals in India because we know it'll slow down digestion by watering down our digestive juices. I said, you are right. But I said to her, I don't think many people think about it. It's just a habit. It's just, it's just what we do. It's just such a fast society. People are rush, 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 rush. Then they sit to eat. Oh, and then they drink. But if you drink between your meals, you will replace the digestive juices. Your brain cells are well, well hydrated. You see, your brain's a hydroelectric system. No hydro, no electricity. So, so there's a time to use water and there's a time not to use water. Number eight is trust in divine power. Trust in divine power takes in all emotional and mental and spiritual aspects of disease. The Bible talks about the benefits of trusting in God. Let me give you a couple that are very beautiful, a couple of my favorites. First, Peter 5 verse 7, it says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And in Isaiah 26 verse 3, it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, he whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. These are what's often called the eight laws of health. They're the physical eight laws of health. Adherence to these laws brings physical healing. If you are not sick, adhering to these laws will maintain health. What are the mental laws? The first mental law must always be Newton's third law of motion, which states to every action there is an equal and an opposite reaction. It is the law of cause and effect. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through nature. Never should the effect be blamed as the cause, and unfortunately it often is. In Proverbs 26 verse 2, the Bible says, the curse causeless shall not come. In other words, no problem happens without a cause. In Galatians 6 verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. And in Job 29 verse 16, the Bible says, The cause I knew not, I searched out. There is always a cause. Absolutely with physical and mental, and often causes are not looked at. So always the detective hat has to be put on, put on to find out why these things are so. Even depression has a cause. It always amazes we when, when a man goes through great hardship, you know, maybe he goes bankrupt, maybe his wife's killed in a car accident. That's a lot. And because he's struggling, He's put on antidepressants. But here we are two years later, he's remarried, his business is going well. He's still on the antidepressants. That defies reason for me. When someone is having a tough time because of uh, lifestyle tragedy, lifestyle hardship, they're not depressed. They're just feeling sad. And it's no wonder they're feeling sad. What they need is the support of their family, the support of their church, a little bit of help. 
depression does have a cause and sometimes the cause of depression is bad air. I've had two men come to our retreat in the last year who developed depression six months after moving into a mouldy house. Because you see, those brain cells aren't producing each cell 36 units of energy. It's only two, which is what happens when there's not enough oxygen. Sunshine, the ultraviolet rays from the sun go through neurochemical pathways, hit the pineal gland and cause a release of serotonin, your mood hormone. A lot of people are depressed because of the effect of alcohol, cigarettes, drugs, caffeines. A lot of people are depressed because they're not sleeping in the hours that they should. A lot of people are depressed because they haven't got enough oxygen and the best way to get oxygen is exercise. A lot of people are depressed because they're eating devitalized food and the brain can't function properly. A lot of people are depressed because they're dehydrated. A lot of people are depressed because they're worried all the time. They're stressed about everything. But God says, in anx be anxious in nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. So you see, often depression is because of a breaking of the physical laws. There is always a cause. The second mental law is the law of choice. And God gave us the gift of choice. You see, God is not in every man. You would never say God was in Hitler or Mugabe. God gave mankind choice. And that's why he says in Revelation 3.19, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He gives us the choice, the choice to know the great God of heaven. God gave us the choice to love. And love is a choice. I didn't realize love was a choice till I was probably in my 30s. But love is a choice. I'm so glad love is a choice. It is not dependent on feeling because if it was, love would quickly go. No, it's a principle. And the, cho the choice to love is made in the front part of our brain where our intellect is. It's in the front part of the brain where our reasoning powers reside. In the front part of the brain is where our judgment takes place. And it's in the front part of the brain where the will is. That's, that's our decision. You see, what we need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. The power of choice God gave to man, it is theirs to exercise. We cannot change our heart. We cannot of ourselves give to God its affections, but we can choose to serve him. We can give him our will. He will then work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That little paragraph is taken by, from a book, Steps to Christ, page 47, a beautiful illustration of the will. Forgiveness is also a choice. And I have found in many cases that people are struggling mentally because they have not forgiven their abuser. You see, it's not what happens to us that determines our destiny. It's the way we respond or react to what happens to us. And forgiveness is a choice. It's a frontal lobe decision. You see, in the brain, here's brain. The front third of the brain is made up of frontal lobe. Whereas the back two thirds of the brain is the feeling part of the brain. And I call the feeling part of the brain a bad boss. Feelings aren't bad, but they make a bad boss because feelings go up and down like the wind. I call the frontal lobe part of the brain the good boss because every decision that the good boss makes is made according to intellect, reason and judgment. It is in the frontal lobe part of the brain where God communicates with mankind. In Isaiah 118, the Bible says, come, let us reason together. That is where God communicates with mankind. But he will not come in unless invited. He is a gentleman. 
That's why he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, he says, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. A lovely illustration of the intimacy with which God wants to know mankind. But there is another force and it's described, this other force, in First Peter 5 and it's beginning with verse it's, it's chapter 5, verse 6. It starts, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, knowing that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeing whom he can devour. Whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called you under his eternal glory, after ye have suffered a while, strengthen, strengthen, establish, perfect you. Beautiful illustrations. God gave us the choice. Do you want the gentleman, the great God of heaven, who loves us so much, or the roaring lion, who's ready to devour? The choice is ours. And many people are devoured. Many people's brains are deteriorating because of unforgiveness. Forgiveness cuts the chains that bind you to painful past. Forgiveness gives you wings and it gives you healing. Forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger and hate. Just do it. Just do it. It's a frontal lobe decision. Don't wait till you feel like it or I'd like to suggest that you'll never do it. You see, the third mental law is that, that your words affect your feelings. Don't wait till you feel like forgiving because you probably never will do it. Just do it. Because once you do it, then your feelings will follow. It's a law of the mind. And I've had people say to me, even two or three days later, do you know I'm feeling better about it? I say, you are experiencing a law of the mind that your words affect your feelings. No wonder the proverb said, He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his mouth shall have destruction. That's Proverbs 13 verse 3. And it's not just um, what you're saying is affecting other people. Your words affect you. That also brings us to the fourth mental law of the mind, and that fourth law states that your words reveal your feelings, and you can't let them all out. Proverbs 29.11 states, that the fool utters all his mind, but the wise man keeps it until afterwards. There's another proverb, it's Proverbs 12, 18. It says, there is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. It's health to the speaker and health to the hearer. So you're upset? It doesn't mean you have to say your mind. Some say it's your right to speak your mind, but it's your obligation not to speak your mind because you don't know the effect of your words. And you also don't fully understand the effects of your words on yourself, on the way your brain functions. Proverbs 23 verse 7 states, or it might be Proverbs 7 verse 23, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mind, the mouth speaks. That's why give your heart to God. When you choose to give your heart to God, he will help you control your feelings. And most people don't realize that our feelings and our thoughts can be controlled more by our frontal lobe than we realize. I liken it to the bridle or the reins. They hold in the feelings. See, your feelings are like a wild horse and they have the tendency to go all over the place. Don't let them. Don't let them. No wonder in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, the Bible says, But thou weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can do that when Christ lives. 
in the frontal lobe. He gives us the ability to hold on to those thoughts and feelings that really should never be expressed. And if you don't express them, they quickly fade away. Your words reveal your feelings, so be very careful on your words. No wonder Proverbs 17, 27 states, even a fool when he holds his peace is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. What's also interesting is that the Bible in the Psalms talks about the reins, talks about the bridle. One is Psalm 39 verse 1, where it says, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. What's the bridle? The bridle is the frontal lobe. You see, that's your board of senses. That's your board of critiques. And feelings will come up and frontal lobe under the direction of the great God of heaven will say, don't say that, or that's a good thing to say. The other psalm is Psalm 16, verse 7, where it says, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel, my reins, my reins also instruct me through the night season. The fifth mental law is the law of adaptation. And the law of adaptation states that we have a changeable brain. It's only in the last 12 years that science has acknowledged this. It was always considered that our brain was hardwired, could not be changed. It's called neuroplasticity. Neuro meaning uh, brain cell, plasticity meaning our brain cells basically are like plastic. When it's melted, it'll mold to whatever shape it comes to. But the Proverbs talked about this neuroplasticity thousands of years ago. One is Proverbs 13 verse... 20, where it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. The other proverb is Proverbs 22, 24, where it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare for thy soul, because of the law of adaptation. Because of the law of adaptation, the sixth mental law states that our brain can grow, and our brain can shrink. What's a terrible shrinking scenario? When we entertain or cherish negativity, little thorns can actually grow between the dendrites. So here's the nerve cell. And these are the dendrites. They're the receiving stations. You see, our nerve cells communicate with each other via little chemical messengers. This is the arm coming out of the nerve cell. It's called the axon. Here are the little filaments coming out of the axon. They're the boutons. And from the boutons, French for buttons, the messages come out and communicate with the next nerve cell. Those messages can be traveling at about 200 kilometers an hour. When we entertain or cherish negativity, thorns can grow between the dendrites. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in her book, Who Switched Off My Brain, she shows this. And those thorns can be damaging, very damaging. No wonder in Mind Cure, which is a chapter in, Mind, in uh, Ministry of Healing, Ellen White says, grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces and invite decay and death into the body. So when we cherish or entertain negativity, science now shows that thorns actually grow between the dendrites. We don't want that. Well, what's a good growing scenario? Every time you learn something new, you grow another dendrite. And we can be growing new dendrites right up until the day that we die. We should never stop learning. Science shows the three most powerful ways to grow new dendrites is learning a musical instrument. And you can learn a new musical instrument no matter what your age. Learning a new language and memorizing scripture. Memorizing scripture, learning a new language and learning a musical instrument, it's the same process for all of them. You know the old saying, practice makes perfect, practice makes permanent. Apply that principle, whether you're learning a musical instrument or whether you're learning a new language or whether you're memorizing scripture. And with all of them, you try too much at first, you'll get overwhelmed. My daughter has a friend who's a violinist. She's a very good violinist. 
and she was applying for an orchestra, she practiced for five hours a day for two weeks before she went for the audition. What, what are you prepared to put into this? If you were to practice for five hours a day memorizing Bible verses, just imagine how much you would have them there. That's the wonderful growing scenario. Every time you learn a new skill, you grow more dendrites. And the research is now showing that one nerve cell has the ability to develop 70,000 dendrites. Wow, the capacity of this brain is phenomenal. What a tragedy that most people never fully utilize what their brain could do. Well, what's a terrible shrinking scenario? If you don't use that brain cell, it will die. That's sad, isn't it? <laughs> You probably know the old saying, if you don't use it, you will lose it. I think it most the most application can be to the brain cell. Well, what's the great shrinking scenario? When you forgive everyone who's ever forgiven, when you forgive everyone who has ever hurt you in your life, you turn painful past to dust. And now there is, there is no bad smell to draw you down there anymore. And because you don't frequently go to that bad memory, the pathway can actually shrink. This is how you can rewire your brain. Let's say you have some anger and bitterness towards someone that hurt you badly, maybe in your childhood, maybe a few years ago. There's a strong pathway there, often because the person keeps going over it. And then they make the decision to forgive. When they go to sleep at night, some cells called glial cells they're the brain's vacuum cleaners and there are more glial cells than even brain cells and we have one trillion brain cells in our, in our skull. Glial cells are activated when we make the decision to forgive. And when we go to bed early, what's early? Between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m., because of our decision to forgive, the glial cells are activated and they come along and they vacuum clean up the thorns. Science now shows us that forgiveness has a physiological effect in the brain to clean it up, to detoxify it. That's the, that's the wonderful shrinking scenario. Let's shrink away those brain cells by forgiving, forgiving everyone who's ever hurt you. If you don't think you can, remember it's just a frontal lobe decision and God will give you the ability to do it. The seventh mental law is the law of diversion. And the law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. What's the old saying? When God closes a door, he opens a window. One man from Italy said, oh, no, 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 Barbara. In Italy, we say when God closes one door, he'll open two. And I think each one of us can be found that that or can testify that that has happened in our life. That the trials in your life not be rocks to crush you, but stepping stones to greater things. And this is why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When we thank God for everything that happens, basically we accept the shut door and we're looking for the open door. These are the physical laws. There are eight of them. These are the mental laws. There are seven of them. What are the moral laws? The diction recalls the Ten Commandments, the great moral code of ethics. Let's have a look at the Ten Commandments. Number one, God says there shall be no other gods before me. Number two, he says thou shalt not make any graven image. So no graven image. I was in Bali only a month ago lecturing and there are a lot of idols and they are so ugly. I think to myself, this must terrify the little children. I'm so glad that we serve a risen saviour who doesn't have to be portrayed in these ugly graven images. So no graven image. Number three, the third moral law is uh, not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. In Australia, this is actually getting to 
um, mammoth amounts. The amount of people who, when they swear, say that wonderful name of Jesus. It nearly breaks my heart. There are people who don't know Jesus. The only time it's said is, is in swearing. And one statement that is very, very common now, you, you hear it, you see it in the newspaper. If you see an ad on television, you see it's, oh my God. In fact, to the point where now in some newspapers I've seen OMG. That's, that's all they say now. They're taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And Australia is an incredibly secular society. And yet they're the ones that are using the wonderful name of Jesus, so sad, in vain. And God says we are not to take that name in vain. The fourth law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days God made heaven and earth and, the, and he rested on the seventh. And so man is to do all his work in six days and rest on the seventh. The fifth moral law is to honour your father and your mother that your days may be long on the earth, father and mother. Do you know, if you honour your father and mother, they will, they will <laughs> then your children will honour you. That's the law of adaptation. Many people dump their parents in aged care and I think to themselves, they're just giving an example of what they want their children to do for you, for them. Life serves back in the coin you pay. That's the law of cause and effect. Number six, thou shalt not steal. So these ones are not. Thou shalt not steal. And number seven is thou shalt uh, not commit adultery. Number eight is um, thou shalt not kill. Number nine is thou shalt not bear false witness, so that thou shalt not lie. And number ten is thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's goods, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife. So these are all the knots. And God says not because if we do, they just hurt us. They hurt us very badly. Many families are falling apart. Many children are being badly hurt because of adultery. And I believe it's because people don't understand love, that love is a choice. Love is not a feeling. When we, when we choose to love, it's because we fall in love with the character. And character gets more beautiful with age. In the book, page 100 of Education, that initial paragraph that I quoted to you. Let me give you that last sentence again. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, or whether it be mental, or whether it be moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy, and ruin. If we are not familiar with the law, then basically we don't know when we are breaking it. So it's very important to become familiar with the laws. And adherence to physical law is physical health. Adherence to mental law is mental health. And adherence to moral law, basically there's your spiritual, your moral, your mental and physical health. You actually can't separate them. Let me, let me give you a couple of quotes that I think say it very well. And this one's found in the book uh, Councils on Diet and Food, and it's page 29, and it's a comment on Daniel. The erect form, the firm elastic step, the fair countenance, the undimmed senses, the untainted breath, all so many certificates of good habits, insignia of the nobility with which nature honours those who are obedient to her laws. <laughs> And then over the page, I think it's page 30, it says, right physical habits 
promote mental superiority. Intellectual power, physical strength and longevity depend upon immutable laws. There is no happen so, no chance about this matter. Nature's God will not interfere to preserve men from the consequences of violating nature's law. There is much sterling truth in the adage, every man is the architect of his own fortune. So the title of this presentation is The Wonder of Law. And the wonder of law is the results of keeping these laws ensures physical, mental, moral, spiritual health. And God has said that above all things, he would like us to be in health. And I also related to you the two forces on this planet, one gently knocking waiting for you to open and invite him in, the other roaming around like a roaring lion, seeing whom he can devour. And I'd like to suggest too, that adherence to these laws puts up a barrier so that that roaring lion cannot catch. He's often looking for little clips. He's often looking for little gaps in the fence. So you can like these to a barrier around you. You can liken those to a fence or a hedge of protection around you. And what God has also done is that even if we have some very well established bad habits like this strong pathway, once we make the decision to turn the corner. Once we make the decision, I'm going to start going to bed early. I'm going to start drinking more water. I'm going to start eating the plant-based diet. I'm going to start checking my words. I'm going to start forgiving everyone who's ever hurt me. We start to make a new pathway. And day by day, as we go down those new pathways, they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And day by day of not going down the old pathway, we have just rewired our brain. God has given us the ability to rewire our brain. And we can be rewiring our brain till the day we die. How long does it take? 21 days. 21 days of not going down the old pathway and 21 days of going down the new pathway and we have rewired our brain. Praise God for this amazing brain. Praise God for the ability that we don't have to be set and stuck in our ways. Never say that you cannot change defects of character because if you say this, you will surely fail. But through the might, grace and power of God, we can overcome and often it starts here. Implement the physical laws which will automatically strengthen your frontal lobe. Implement the mental laws and mentally it will strengthen the frontal lobe. And when the frontal lobe is strong and we have a communication with God, we have allowed him to live in our frontal lobe, he will empower us to keep the moral law. No wonder he says in Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, I will take away your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And he says, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and you will do them. Isn't that good news? We are not alone. And everything God asks us to do, he automatically comes through and empowers us to do it. He's just waiting for us to say, come in.